down. Um, I thought it'd be kind of a useful place to start um, with this chart, which is really the chart that defines the tech industry for the last 20 years, the growth of the internet, and then the growth of smartphones. And the thing about this chart is we're now, it's now getting really boring because we've almost finished. Over three quarters of people are now online, um, and pretty much three quarters of all the adults on Earth have a smartphone, and all of the rest are going to have one as well. Um, but that part of the story is running to a close. There's another part of the story that's still really only just getting started. So while the internet and smartphones are now almost done, e-commerce is still really at a low level of penetration. And as we look at the next 20 years, there's a couple of building blocks to think about. Um, most people are online, most of the money is not. But as all of that money moves, it will happen in different ways. It will not just be a continuation of what we've seen in the last 20 years, but will change a lot of those industries as we do it. And as we do that, we have some new fundamental structural layers um, to build tools with, to build applications with, um, and to create new kinds, of, new kinds of experience. And so I'll talk about each of those in turn and start by talking about market sizes. And this is our basic market size. This is global e this, sorry, this is US e-commerce. And it seems to be pretty big, um, getting up on for $100 billion a quarter now. Uh, but if you zoom out and look at overall retail, um, it's about 9% of US retail spending. Um, that's, of course, not including bars and restaurants. And as you may know, that's also something that's starting to get addressed by technology, with restaurant delivery and food delivery and so on. And then there's some other interesting things inside that as well. So gas stations in the US are now bigger than e-commerce, and most of all of that is going to disappear in the next 10 to 20 years as we move to electric. Um, in fact, the same thing applies to carts. Americans spend over a, a trillion dollars a year on cars and parts and repairs, and as electric reduces the number of moving parts in a car by five to 10 times, um, and autonomy changes what it means to own a car, all of that money is going to come and drift and start moving to other places. Um, but then retail of itself is only one part of the picture. Overall, consumer spending is something in the US is something over tri $10 trillion. And so actually, as we think about the opportunity, that US e-commerce number looks pretty tiny still compared with everything else that's going to change. The same thing looks, happens when you look at how we decide what to buy or how people in this room tell people what they might like to buy. Um, advertising is now the largest single ad segment. It's over $200, $200 billion last year globally. In the US, it's close to 40% of all advertising spending. Um, so this looks pretty big. And we start hearing people suggest that maybe we're going to start topping out, that Google's revenue is going to start topping out. After all, advertising is pretty stable as a percentage of GDP. It tends not to go up or down very much as a share of GDP. And, if, and so advertising overall should be static. So internet should be static. So we should be done. Well, maybe except there's another whole other pool of money that Google and Facebook don't really talk about, which is marketing. And if we look at that category, we see things in here um, that seem highly relevant to Google and Facebook. I don't really understand why if you buy a TV spot that gets counted as advertising and it's relevant to Google, but if you do telemarketing or direct mails or sell, sell support, that's somehow an entirely different pool of money and nobody talks about it. Um, that is to say, if I pay for placement in Amazon search results, that gets called advertising. But if I pay for placement in Walmart um, or in all sorts of other places, then that gets called marketing. Actually, it's all the same thing. It's all the same job that's being done. And then there's other kinds of money that get spent to reach a customer. Things like packaging and parceling and shipping, and of course, retail rents, because rent is logistics and rent is marketing. These are all ways of reaching a customer and telling somebody what they want to, might want to buy. So the overall amount of money that's addressable here that is, has to do with how we tell people what to get and what to buy is going to get a lot bigger. Um, globally, advertising and marketing combined are about a trillion dollars. Um, internet is still less than a quarter of that. Um, but there's much more to think about as to how that will expand. And so then we think, well, what else is the opportunity? Because these are still mostly US charts, but that's a global question. So I think as a way of understanding what that might look like, it's useful to look at one of the first pieces of global technology, which is the spread of industrialization. And so this is share of industrial output by the company, country that created this, which is the UK, and then the cheap overseas low-wage economy that ripped it all off, which was the USA. Um, and so there you see the diffusion of, of industrialization, but then there's something else that happened um, going forward to 2015. Relatively unsurprising, if we zoom into that and ask, well, what is it that's changed here, we can see um, the growth of China. Um, you see a very similar picture if you look at the spread of computing. So the US and Western Europe basically created computing, and this is where global computing was in 1993. Close to three quarters of it was in the US and Western Europe. Today, it's less than a quarter. Um, and of course, the balance, a lot of the balance of that, again, has gone to China. Flipping the, the axis here, you can see something similar if we look at usage. So this is global 
um, mobile data consumption in 2014 versus 2017. Um, you can see here APAC, which is basically India and China, a little bit of Japan, uh, it, it, a little bit of Japan in there, but mostly India and, chi um, India and China, um, has vastly outstripped um, consumption in the rest of the world. Um, that in turn reflects the spread of the global middle class. There are more middle class people in APAC now than there were on Earth in, 20, in 2009. Um, and that, of course, then flows into e-commerce. And again, Chinese e-commerce today is bigger than global e-commerce was um, only a couple of years ago. And so we tend, particularly as I live in Silicon Valley, and in Silicon Valley when people say the East Coast, they tend to mean Oakland, we tend to have a relatively constrained view of what the global opportunity looks like. In fact, e-commerce in the US is much smaller than it is in, in a couple of other developed markets, never mind just looking at China. Um, and so then we talk and look at these opportunities, and we tend to talk in terms of these four big American companies. We tend to talk about Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, or GAFA, they're sometimes termed. Sometimes people stuff Netflix in there so that they can say FANG, which sounds scary, but Netflix doesn't really seem like it should be on this list, if you look at the scale of it. Um, three other companies that don't get talked about nearly as much, BAT, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, which are the three big internet giants in China. Um, smaller because they're not global, but growing very fast and still really very, very big companies. Um, but we kind of need to generalize a little bit beyond just these internet giants that make kind of convenient bogeymen and good ways to get headlines, but there's a lot of other company creation going on. These are a couple, just a couple, of other big global companies, five, ten, fifty billion dollar companies that have been created that most people who aren't in the field have never even heard of. Most people have never heard of ByteDance, which is valued at um, 75 billion dollars in its last um, capital raising. This, of course, reflects what's happening, which is the spread of entrepreneurship. So, um, the dawn of the internet age, almost all venture capital happened in the USA. Today, that's only three quarters, an awful lot happening in China, happening in, the India, in India, happening in the rest of the world. Really, what happens here is that the technology got created in one place, but now it diffuses and it goes everywhere. So then again, we ask what the opportunity is. Well, there's US e-commerce, and then there's US retail, which is a lot bigger. Um, but then we have global retail, which is over $20 trillion, and we have global consumer spending, which is over $40 trillion. And those are the kinds of pools of capital um, that we're starting to think about addressing. How do we address those? Um, well, it's useful to think, I think, about kind of new problems. Um, one of the ways I think you could characterize this is that for the first 20 years of the internet, we did things that were easy. Um, they didn't feel easy at the time. Like, Entrepreneurs in 2000 didn't feel like they were having an easy life. But what we did was things that would work if you had not many people online, if you had not much acceptance of doing stuff online, if you had not much capital. Um, and so you tended to sell tools rather than create entire businesses. You tended to do a, lot, do a lot of information arbitrage. So you sell tickets instead of putting the thing together itself. Today we do things that presume high internet penetration, presume people will buy anything online, um, presume people will buy things that they would have to touch, like fashion. For a very long time, people presumed no one would ever buy fashion online. Um, and we tend to build businesses that change the character of what it is that you're doing in that industry. Good example of, of a way of thinking about this, if you think about Yelp, um, fantastic company created in the old internet, doesn't need a huge amount of capital, it's selling tools to restaurants and providing tools for free to consumers. It's an information arbitrage business, an information aggregation business. Restaurant delivery is a completely different challenge. It needs much more money. It changes what it is to be a restaurant. It changes what it is to eat. Um, and it build, uses information in completely different ways. And so this is kind of an example of how we change the character of the problem. Um, but we also change the character of the industry that we're addressing. Yelp doesn't change what it is to be a restaurant. DoorDash changes what it is to be a restaurant. So if we look at that $40 trillion of consumer spending and kind of run up the stack, there's categories here that haven't really been addressed at all by technology, um, and there's also categories that have only been addressed in pretty sort of superficial ways. So if you think about something like housing, we obviously have listings and we have mortgage price comparisons. We've invested in a company called Open Door that will buy your house from you so that you don't have to wait three months to find a buyer. They'll buy it from you, make a market in it, find a buyer for, them, for it themselves. So we change what it is to buy and sell houses. Right up at the top, healthcare, we used to have websites that you could use to persuade yourself you had the bubonic plague. Um, now we edit DNA, and we actually build fundamentally different kinds of cures for diseases. So right the way across that, it's not just that technology addresses them, it's it does fundamentally different things to them. So we've got a couple of examples here, and I think the best place to talk about this is if we look at retail. And I think at a very, very high level, you could describe retail as sitting on a spectrum between, on the one end, retail as logistics, and at the other, retail as taste, recommendation, preference, discovery, advice, curation, insert your thesaurus here. Um, and so on the left, you have Sears Warbuck, Sears Roebuck, and you have um, Walmart on the right, um, most of the people in this room. Um, and what's happening is that the internet has really only done the first of these. Amazon is basically Sears Roebuck. Um, 
And we've not really, the technology industry, the internet industry has not really addressed the category on the right very much. What's happening now is that we're doubling down on retailer logistics. So we have same day delivery, we have free delivery, we have um, in particular groceries. Um, but at the same time, we're also addressing the other one and finding ways of, 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 of how you might scale and distribute taste and preference and curation over the internet. So talk about each of those in turn. Um, first of all, if we look at the global retail industry, the US is going to be affected much more than anywhere else because the US is massively overstored. There's far more retail um, space per square foot in the US than there is anywhere else in the world. But if we think about how that's going to change, um, I'm old enough to remember when e-commerce e was supposed to be asset light, and the idea that an e-commerce company might buy trucks was like a really stupid idea from the bubble, and like, you'd have to be out of your mind to do that. In fact, the original Amazon um, business plan said there was going to be no warehouses and no stock and no shipping. It was all going to be drop shipping, so they wouldn't own any inventory or have any physical assets. That plan didn't last very well. Um, in fact, now Amazon has got its own airline um, and a fleet of trucks because yeah, Amazon um, does everything. And so as we think about that, the, kind of the best expression of, that, of this, I think, is to look at groceries. Um, groceries break the Amazon model. Because for Amazon, everything is about having a single unified commodity logistics bit model, logistics layer in which absolutely every product gets treated exactly the same. And of course, you can't do that with groceries because eggs break and fruit spoils and things get bruised and they go off. And so you need to build a completely separate logistics platform to do groceries from everything else. Um, the thing is, as the chart shows you here, it's such a big business that it's worth doing it because US groceries are more than double the size of total US e-commerce. Um, again, this is something where the US is going to be, um, is, is kind of an outlier. Um, so this is um, online grocery revenue last, uh, this year. Um, China is big, of course, because that's leapfrogging formal retail. Japan is big as well. Um, but it's interesting if you then flip this um, and look at the revenue per capita, again, you see a bunch of developed markets that are way, way ahead of the USA. It's sort of been interesting to explain to my US colleagues a few years ago that buying groceries online was actually a thing. Um, and so this is, again, something we're going to see a lot of change. Um, more interesting, though, is not just that you will buy groceries online, but that you will buy different stuff. So this chart shows you the SKUs, that's to say the number of products that were stocked in a supermarket in 1975 versus a supermarket today in a Walmart supercenter. And the point of this chart is that when you change the buying process, when you change the buying journey, um, people don't just buy the same stuff but in a different place, they buy different things. And so when you go from a corner shop to a supermarket to a Walmart, you don't have exactly the same weekly purchase, you buy different stuff. When you went from a, a draper in the centre of Paris to a, a department store, um, you bought different stuff. And so with every change in the retail model, we change what gets bought, we change the mix of advertising and marketing and pricing, we change the sort of fundamental distribution of products within the market. The same thing will happen now with groceries in particular, but also with, with all kinds of retail categories in general. Um, and so there is a retailer's logistics model, there's also a retailer's tastemaker. Um, I think a good way of thinking about this is that the internet lets you buy anything you could buy in New York. This is also, of course, what Sears Roebuck did. You could live on a farm in Wisconsin, and you could buy almost anything you could buy in New York. But it doesn't let you shop the way you shop in New York. That's kind of a different question. Um, and now we have things that are changing that or allowing to address some of those kinds of questions. So we have all the social media we're familiar with. We have all kinds of new economic models, rental, subscription, delivery, and so on. Um, we have the kind of interesting blurring of marketing spending versus advertising spending versus rent as ways of acquiring customers. Hence this line, rent is the new CAC, rent is the new customer acquisition cost. Um, and then, of course, we have machine learning coming at the end of this, um, giving us kind of fundamentally new ways of um, thinking about how we might suggest and discover products, which is sort of something I'll come back to talk about later. Um, what that means is there's all sorts of stuff that were really fucking stupid ideas that would never have worked, and then they're now working. So buying fashion online, you know, you're out of your mind. Buying glasses online, come on, forget it. Um, cosmetics, makeup, you haven't tried. Um, none of this stuff was going to work, and of course all of these things are now starting to work because of all of the things that I've just talked about. Um, come back to the point I made earlier that we're addressing new problems. You could actually, though, say what we've really done for the first 20 years is we really only did retail and advertising. We, those are the things that have been demolished. Newspapers, obviously, but no one cares about them. Um, and then there's everything else. Um, and that's what the next 20 years does. So here is my sort of the chart that tells you I don't really like log scales. Um, so the US e-commerce um, at $400 billion versus global um, GDP, which is um, about $75 trillion. And actually, we think about addressing all of those kinds of categories. Um, obvious example, cars. There's this little company in California called Tesla that's having a go at making cars. They're doing quite well. You may have heard about them. Um, these are what happened with it. These are the, the sales of the newest Model 3. Um, and it's interesting to compare this now that Tesla is outselling in the last quarter all of the other premium luxury car manufacturers in the USA. Um, so Tesla's doing quite well. But again, what's the opportunity? Well, the opportunity is three or four million cars sold a quarter. Um, 
and electric hasn't even scratched the surface there. It will. It will take all of that. But as we think about changing um, what the car market looks like, the point isn't Tesla. The point is what's inside a car. And so what this chart is showing you um, is the difference between the components in a petrol car, which is the column on the right, and the components in an electric car, which all come from completely different companies. They come from LG. Um, they come from Korean and Chinese electronics companies. All of the components and the supply chain of a car looks completely different when you go to electric. It's not that you get rid of the gas tank, the petrol tank. It's that you rip the spine out of the car, and you reduce the number of moving parts by five or 10 times. So you change what a car is. Um, you also change what you even mean when you say car. Um, so it's not just that the car will drive around, but it will be electric. It's you'll be taking a scooter, or you'll be taking a two-person pod, or you'll be taking a, an any kind of other vehicle. Just as much as when we went from the horse to the internal combustion engine, we had all sorts of new vehicle types. As we go to electric and autonomy, again, we have all sorts of new vehicle types. We change what it means to say car. Um, we talk about car. What are you going to do in the car if you're not watching um, the road? Well, you'll probably watch TV, or also drink, but you'll watch TV. Um, and so this, is a ni this chart shows you um, production budgets for Netflix and Amazon versus the, the US majors. And as you can see, these are now real contenders. They're spending as much money as major US media companies on television. Um, this is a great quote from 2010. Worrying about Netflix is what, like worrying about the Albanian army. Um, I hope somebody's paying attention to the Albanian army, um, <laughs> or at least to Jeffrey. Um, more interesting, though, I think, is to ask, well, what do we mean when we say TV? So more people watch streaming games by several multiples than watch Netflix or HBO. And the last um, AAA game, the so-called kind of the last premium game, um, had a bigger opening weekend than the last couple of big Hollywood blockbusters. Um, and so then if you look again at eSports, which is kind of a weird name, but means watching other people play games, which sounds almost as insane as watching other people play sports. Like, why would you want to do that? Um, but apparently this is a thing. Um, I don't understand either of these categories, but apparently this is a thing. Um, and so we have eSports now attracting equivalent audiences to some of the major US um, um, consumer sports audience, mass participation sports. Um, but then the revenue, of course, is not there yet. The revenue will be there. I don't normally like these apples to oranges comparisons, but sometimes they really tell you something fundamental about what's going to change. Um, and of course, meanwhile, when we think about TV consumption overall, it's on a steady flat line, down, flat to downward trend, whereas the time spent on the internet is continuing to go up and will continue to go over, up, up and overtake TV. Um, so there is... Um, there is television, then there is money, which seems like an interesting and important question. Um, $33 billion invested in financial technology startups in the first half of the year. That's kind of one statistic amongst many. Um, but most of these things are addressing existing kinds of market. I think it's interesting to think about the overall opportunity here. Again, we have trillion dollar pools of capital, not just the consumer part, but this is the kind of the revenue being attracted by the industry. So payments, retail, banking, insurance are all trillion dollar industries. Then, of course, there is housing, which is fundamentally a financial um, market, which is over $20 trillion. All of this is now being addressed by financial technology companies being funded out of Silicon Valley and other global technology hubs. Um, Meanwhile, there's a whole bunch of people on, on Earth who have no access to any of this stuff. So even in the US, 5 to 10% of people are not in the banking system. Globally, it's, more, it's well over 25%. But even then, when you look into the US, most people sort of have banking. An awful lot of people are what are called underbanked, which it means that basically they are in a kind of a second-tier banking system that is exploitative and oppressive and kind of keeps them in poverty, for want of a better term. All of these people will be addressed in the next couple of decades. They won't be addressed by giving them all a paper checkbook and a bank account and a credit card. They'll be addressed with all kinds of different models that unbundle what it is to have access to financial services. Best example of this is mobile payment. Um, China um, has over 75% penetration of mobile payment. The chart that you see here on the right, which I did check three or four times, is the volume of consumer payment going through basically Alipay and a couple of other things, over $12 trillion um, last year. Um, and so what's happened is that China has basically bypassed the financial services system that we had in the West and gone straight to a new model of what financial services might look like. Um, and this, what drives this, again, is sort of fundamentally new building blocks. So there are totally different consumer expectations of what a financial service would, lo would look like. Availability of data means you can build products in completely different ways. You can unbundle services, so you don't just have to get everything from one bank. You can go to different companies for different products. And again, we have machine learning um, shaping the kinds of products that you can create the final thing to talk about, um, which software eats everything else, software probably eats death. Um, well, drug discovery is a $75 billion market, and machine learning means this is fundamentally different. The ability to edit DNA and edit, edit, to edit cells means this fundamentally changes. We can create completely different kinds of cures to anything that was possible in the past. Um, 
But drug discovery is actually a pretty small part of the overall healthcare market. In fact, the overall healthcare market is over $7 trillion. There's all sorts of other pools of capital where money is being spent here. And as we think about how we address this, well, we have technology, which means it gives, it gives us new ways to discover drugs. Um, but we also have fundamentally new ways to diagnose. We can find out that you have cancer two years earlier or three years earlier or five years earlier than we would have done before. And so we save many more lives. We save many more resources that can be spent on something else. But then we also ask the question, well, that's just kind of the cost of being sick. Um, if over $7 trillion is the cost of, of being sick, what's the cost of not getting sick? What's the cost of not dying? Um, that opportunity might be bigger again, um, the ability to change all of those outcomes um, from the beginning. So one of the ways we can think about this, and sorry, this is a slightly geeky reference, um, but this is an image of a, a monster in a famous video game called Doom. And the reason I use this comparison is that this is the monster you get to at the end of the game when you've done all the easy stuff. And kind of what, one of the ways you can think about what tech's been doing for the last 20 years is we've been kind of killing the easy monsters, and now we're going out and killing the hard monsters. We're kind of getting to the boss mode, and we're addressing kind of difficult, newer, and fundamentally different kinds of problems that are much more difficult than the problems we addressed before. Um, layers to think about, tools to do this, building blocks to use for this. Um, Think about how the internet has been organized over the last couple of decades. Before the internet, we had things like AOL and interactive TV or the information superhighway. Just the statement information superhighway just sums up the idea that this was going to be kind of completely centralized and controlled. And it turned out that that was all a blind alley. And what we got was the internet and the web. And the internet and the web were fundamentally decentralized and permissionless. You didn't need to get permission from the phone company or a department store to launch a product. You could just do it. Um, and then we got these new organizing layers on top. We got Google and Facebook, um, which kind of came after the internet, came after the web, and gave us layers on top to organize and discover. Um, and those layers are, again, centralized, and they function by capturing intent and meaning and value at kind of four or five levels of, 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 um, of abstraction. So Google doesn't know what that page is. It knows what other pages link to that page and what pages link to those pages. It doesn't know what you're interested in. It knows what keyword you, you searched for and what pages are on those keywords. And other people make a guess as to what those keywords might be worth and place bids for them. So you have three or four levels of abstraction between the actual meaning um, and the level of understanding that the computer system has or that the advertising system has. And the same thing for Facebook. Facebook doesn't know who you are. It just knows what text appears on that page that you, set, that you shared. Now we have another set of another wave of decentralization. So after we had the internet and the web and then we had these centralized layers, now we have these new decentralized layers um, of machine learning and of crypto, cryptocurrency, blockchain. And I'll talk about each of those in turn and then um, pause for breath. And so I think a good way of thinking about machine learning is to ask what this is. Actually, everyone in this room will know exactly what this is. But the question is, well, what would Google say about this image? Um, and so Google would say, well, this is on pages that say Wishbone and Hans Wagner. It doesn't know what it is. It just knows that's what's on the pages. Facebook will say, well, you people who shared this picture liked um, links to other furniture. So maybe it's you're interested in furniture. Amazon will say, it's a SKU. I don't understand the question. What do you mean? Um, it's a SKU. <laughs> um, and that's the only kind of understanding that these companies have about these. Now, we go forward a few years and think about machine learning, and we have a layers of meaning that weren't possible before. The first layer we have is, well, it's a chair, and that's something that wasn't possible before. And that has very profound consequences just at that level for e-commerce, because so far, Amazon doesn't know what that thing is. This is why we have all these jokes about buying a refrigerator on Amazon, and Amazon says, um, you like refrigerators, clearly you're collecting them. Here are five more. Would you like to buy one? Um, because it doesn't know what it is. It's just a scoop. Well, now you know it's a chair. But you go a step further, and you kind of know what it, the chair is and what that might mean. It's a design classic. It's Scandinavian. OK, if you're interested in that, I'm not going to show you any more Disney Cruises ads. Um, that is to say, you can make successive layers of inference and extrapolation and understanding around what these things might mean at much broader levels than just looking at it as and saying, well, it's black and it's a chair. Of course, this is not just limited to e-commerce or consumer applications. It's exactly the same thing applies, for example, in healthcare. So straightforward example is computer vision means you can look at an x-ray more accurately than a radiographer and detect cancer. But then you can say, well, I've got all these metrics coming into, and I can suggest that you're probably going to have a heart attack in the next day or two. But you can go a step further, and you can say, well, looking at your lifestyle and your, your Instagram and your search patterns and your exercise patterns and where you live and where you work, um, you probably need to change your behavior, or you're going to have a heart attack, or you're going to get lung cancer, or you're going to get diabetes. That's to say, again, you get to successive layers of meaning, successive layers of inference. 
Um, one of the kind of useful ways we have of, of thinking about machine learning is to think about scaling people. And there's two very different ways to think about scaling people. One of them is, I have a million pictures in the basement. I have never had time to look at them all. Now I can send a million interns into the basement and look at them and tell me what's there. Count all the red shirts, count all the cars. I have a million interns, now I can listen to every phone call coming into the call center and tell me the calls where the customer is angry or the call, ag call agent was rude. So you have a million interns who can go and do something for you. But there's something very different, which is, well, what if you sent one intern into the basement to look at all of those pictures? Then they'd come back and they'd say, well, when I looked at the third million picture, this really interesting pattern started coming out. What if you put a camera in the right part of Berlin and you took a photograph of every interesting person aged under 30? And then what would you do with that if you were a fast fashion company? You would know everything that people were wearing now. You'd also know everything that anybody had worn over the last five years. And what pattern would come out of that? What would you start thinking this might remind you of or that might be interesting? Again, how would you scale that? What kind of implications and patterns might you pull out of that? Final thing to talk about is cryptocurrency. Sorry, this is another kind of crypto. Um, I think a useful way of understanding this is to go back to the early days of the internet. In the early 90s, if you had said, um, what does the internet, why does the internet matter? You'd have said, well, it's decentralized and it's distributed and it's permissionless and anyone can build an application. We don't know what the application is. So this is, um, on the right here, it's internet traffic in 1993. The web was 3% of internet traffic. The rest of it was this stuff that nobody ever uses anymore, obviously, except for email um, up at the top. So we didn't know what the applications were. The point was the capability. The same thing with cryptocurrency. It's not the applications, it's the capability. We have a decentralized network that lets us build trust, that lets us build value exchange, that lets us build payment. And we're trying to work out, well, what would that mean, just as in the early 90s we were working out what that would mean for the internet. Final thing, so I'll sort of skip forward. The final thing to talk about here is kind of, I called this presentation the end of the beginning. Um, we've finished half of this, but we haven't really started actually addressing the broader markets. And I think a nice way to capture this is this adorable photograph of a young man called Jeffrey Bezos, um, who has just entered the online books business, and doesn't he look like it? Um, this is what Jeffrey Bezos looks like today. <laughs> And I think that kind of captures where Amazon has come in the last 20 years. Um, this, of course, is what Jeff Bezos is working on now. Um, so that's maybe where he's going to go in the next 20 years. Thank you.